afternoon. This is Professor David Weiss speaking once again from the New Jersey City University's Institute for Dispute Resolution, and of course, its flagship program, Connecting Bridges and Borders, that focuses on business and global affairs around the world. We're looking forward to today's conversation. It's on education, innovation, entrepreneurship, and of course, business. And with us is a good personal friend and colleague of mine, Tamor Paquet. Tamor uh, has worked at many universities, both here and abroad. He focuses in family business. He's focused uh, on international work, all around education, all around innovation, entrepreneurship, economic development. He was recently at Fairleigh Dickinson University as the executive director of the Rothman Institute, which is one of the seminal programs for family businesses in the state of New Jersey. And currently he resides at Columbia University School of Engineering. Timor, welcome to the show today. How are you? Good, thanks, uh, Professor Weiss. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, well, I appreciate you taking the time. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, Tamor, let's, let's jump in for our listeners both here and abroad, just so they get a perspective of the concept of education in today's world as we focus on both business and innovation and entrepreneurship in the context of education and its role it can play. Um, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, um, I have spent... Um, close to uh, 15 years working uh, in the educational space, uh, having taken on a, a number of different roles. So um, my first foray into hi higher education was working for the International School of Management. Uh, it, uh, it is a international uh, business school based in Paris uh, with campuses in New York, Sao Paulo, uh, Tokyo, at Shanghai. And uh, I was actually uh, the director of New York uh, based programs um, and uh, we uh, were partnered with uh, St. John's University and Baruch College. So I worked with a number of international students uh, doing everything from designing, uh, you know, uh, exchange programs uh, for these French students who were visiting New York, helping them land internships, uh, developing uh, partnerships with companies so that they could hire these, uh, these graduates. Um, I eventually moved on from that role and um, landed at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and I was the head of the uh, Rothman Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for three years. And for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Rothman Institute, we uh, were the, one of the oldest um, entrepreneurship institutes uh, in the US uh, with the goal of not only educating students about becoming um, small business owners, entrepreneurs, innovators, but also doing quite a bit of um, outreach. Uh, you know, we, we really played a, a pivotal role in serving the veterans community. So I actually helped to expand the Veterans Entrepreneurship Program, uh, you know, growing uh, funding for the program, uh, recruiting corporate sponsors, uh, and, and expanding enrollment so that we could serve the, the, the needs of veterans. Uh, veterans that uh, were finding difficulty transitioning from um, the military world into civilian life. Um, secondly, I uh, helped to, uh, to grow our family business forum, working with, uh, with family businesses based uh, in New Jersey, um, as well as uh, doing a number of different events for family businesses, recognizing their, uh, their, their accomplishments in the business world and their philanthropy. Um, I also um, worked with my team in hosting a number of pitch competitions for our students and also actual entrepreneurs uh, I connected entrepreneurs with, uh, with seed and angel investors, uh, and um, I made sure that uh, the Rothman Institute uh, was not only uh, contributing to uh, the, the startup community, but, um, but also connecting industry with academia uh, in, in the business school. Um, so in 2018, I eventually moved on to Columbia University's uh, Foo Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science, and I am currently the Associate Director of Executive Education. Uh, I work for Columbia Video Network, um, which is a, um, an online learning division of the School of Engineering. Uh, we're, we have number one in graduate engineering degrees, uh, according to the US News and World Report. Um, so we do fully online master's and doctorate uh, degrees, as well as a number of non-degree programs spanning from MOOCs, 
to executive education courses and boot camps. Uh, and these boot camps are uh, intensive six month um, academic programs for career changers and those you know, with non-technical backgrounds that wanna get into uh, the areas of coding or data analytics, cybersecurity, FinTech, you know, th those um, um, business sectors that are, that are really in demand um, at this moment. So um, I've, I've, I've wore a number of different hats in higher education, really delighted to be here and um, love to share my thoughts about the future of education and, um, and the importance of entrepreneurship right now. That is an amazing background that you have tomorrow because you cross so many different mediums, both internationally, as well as domestically here in the United States, as well as different sectors of the facets of business. Uh, not just as you said, you correctly pointed out, not just within the uh, support for student experiences, but also what you do in, uh, outside for providing professional experiences. So let's jump into the first question. And, and I'm, I'm really curious to know, given the context of education, I think we need to start from uh, what I've come to understand is this pandemic era. And we really need to look at or explore and examine what was happening before the era. So can you give our listeners just a little brief insight how you viewed or, or you looked at that particular moment in time as a reflection point to where we are currently? Sure, I, I think that's a great question. You know, I, I think right now, uh, you know, with the advent of the pandemic, higher education uh, is really at a crossroads. Um, I think those, you know, more traditional, smaller brick and mortar institutions are trying to figure out how are they gonna fill their, their freshman year class uh, in the fall? Um, and you know, I think there's also this question on what does reopening look like? How do we ensure that classrooms and in-person experiences are gonna be safe for, for, the, for students? So, uh, you know, we have to really look back at what was happening prior to the arrival of COVID. Um, I think, you know, with, you know, with, with, with schools in general, uh, you know, those that are maybe in, in tier two, tier three, um, I think they're gonna really struggle um, in, uh, in the fall to, to fill, out, uh, fill up their, uh, you know, their freshman classes. And I think it's because um, they have not communicated how they're gonna reopen it and be safe. For, for students. And so you've, you hear a lot of uh, reports in, in the media about students thinking about doing a gap year um, rather than enrolling um, you know, in, in, a, in the university they got into. Um, so um, you know, I, I think, you know, whereas you know, with larger institutions that uh, are you know, maybe more elite um, research institutions, I think they are also worried about how they're gonna fill up their, their classrooms, but you know, they have um, worked very closely with, with, with local and state governments on, um, on how to adhere to CDC guidelines and apply those guidelines to, to their schools. So I, I know with Columbia, uh, you know, we're, you know we're, we're, we're thinking about, you know, possibly opening um, in the fall, uh, using, you know, um, you know, allowing students to, to attend classes fully online and then maybe transitioning to more in-person um, um, person, in -person experience in uh, the spring, but also having some flexibility. If, you know, if they're not feeling comfortable coming to campus, they could take some other classes online or in, in a hybrid model. But, um, but going back to you know, what, was, what was higher education like pre-COVID, uh, I can say that you know, um, you know, there's, there's always been this, um, uh, uh, question mark around tuition, uh, tuition rate. I think, you know, uh, we've come to a time where, uh, you know, students uh, that are graduating from high school, thinking about college, don't want to rack up debt like, um, you know, previous generations. Um, and, it, you know, this is, you know, one, uh, getting into a good university is, even, is, is still very competitive, but two, the job market is even more competitive. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they are, students are really at a position, in a position to really think wisely uh, about where they want to go. How do they use uh, their dollars? Do they really want to be in debt? How much debt do they want, do they want to be in? So these are kind of the, the ideas and, and, and thoughts that um, prospective students, uh, you know, graduating high school students were, were, were mainly thinking about. And I know here in, in New York State, 
um, you know, Governor Cuomo uh, was talking about making the CUNY system free for, uh, for graduating high school students. But, um, you know, it, the, it, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of misunderstanding of, of, uh, about, his, um, about his idea. It's, it wouldn't be free for everybody. It would be free for, you know, a certain percent. It would still be very competitive to get into uh, a very free program. So it's not sort of like universal health care is for everyone. This is not universal higher education for everyone. So I know states are thinking about how do you make higher education more affordable? And I think those, those are the types of conversations we were having as a nation prior to, to COVID-19. So, um, you know, now that, we, now that we've entered, um, you know, this, this pandemic, uh, you know, schools, you know, I, you know, I've been looking at articles, for instance, uh, Scott Galloway wrote a really interesting article uh, in the Intelligencer, he is a an NYU Stern uh, faculty member, and he talks about how uh, you know traditional brick and mortar schools may not make it through this pandemic. Uh, you know, I think you know something else that was was occurring pre-pandemic is a number of schools, even well-known schools, were having financial problems. You know, I, I don't want to name any particular schools, but I I think um, that you know prior to COVID, if they were having financial problems, then they are going to be in really rough shape, uh, you know, during and after this this pandemic. So um, I think there was a school like uh, Sweetbriar down in, in Virginia, a uh, very well known, you know, small liberal arts college that did, that had financial issues and didn't make it, um, you know, and closed a couple of years back. You know, I, I think the conversation now is: Are there going to be a number of well known smaller liberal arts colleges that are not going to make it financially through this? Um, and I think some of the strategies for these schools is how are we going to survive this? How are we going to weather the storm? So they're looking at one, you know, how can we increase uh, alumni engagement, alumni donation? Uh, two, how can we cut our budgets? Um, you know, would that be cutting certain programs, cutting athletic scholarships? Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe recruiting fewer um, tenure track faculty. Three, you know you know, maybe, uh, you know, expanding online offerings. And I think that that's something that, you know, as I mentioned, Scott Galloway talked about in his article in, in The Intelligencer. There are gonna be a lot of elite institutions that are gonna par be partnering with tech companies um, to make their courses not only online, but not only in enhancing the online experience, but making it available to more people as a way to increase enrollment. So are we gonna see uh, elite institutions partner with Google? or, uh, you know, partner with Apple, uh, you know, partner with Facebook to, to increase student enrollment. And I think that, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if this financial hardship continues to press a lot of schools, I think, you know, schools are really gonna have um, these, you know, these conversations internally, you know, as, as sort of uh, kind of uh, conversation around survival mechanism. How are they gonna weather the storm? So I think you know that that is really what, what is on a lot of um, higher education, um, you know, board of trustees and and leadership um, radar. If that if that makes sense, it does. You know, and and I, I think what it does is it provides a little context around a number of different issues that probably were there and would have showed there they were already like you said properly uh, before to to. In your in your narrative of before the pandemic, institutions that were suffering from malaise and not really adapting to where we were even before the pandemic, where where we were going, right? And maybe they had some gunpowder still, or they had tax based dollars. And so what we've done here is because of this existential factor being the pandemic, it seems to have accelerated that discussion. And in some cases for institutions, it's gonna accelerate the lifespan of the institution itself. My question is, when you look at the current structure, the current situation, you know, there was an interesting article in the New York Times about the definition of what would be called not white collar jobs, but tooling for white collars, the new definition era of what a white collar job may look like, such as AI technology, data privacy, data security. Now you already touched upon a little bit, I think entrepreneurially, 
how larger institutions like yours certainly would be exploring partnerships with name brand large multinational companies like Amazon and Google. Do you see a space within that same model for smaller institutions that are adaptable and also want to create these sort of, um, we'll call it university campus within the company structure that's partnered with the university, classic university itself? Yeah, I th I think that's I think that's you know a great idea. I haven't heard those types of conversations um, among smaller institutions, but you know again I think I think the strategy is for many institutions to be well connected to industry, and that could be um, that could be facilitated by alumni of those respective schools uh, that are well positioned in X Y Z company that could perhaps um, you know, create a talent pipeline between the university, their alma mater, and the company they work for. Um, you know, in my role at, at Columbia Engineering, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we run these, these boot camps for, um, for non-traditional learners. You know, typically, the, those that have a liberal arts background, they've been out of school for two to five years, and they're, you know, they're not really going very far in their career, and they're seeing uh, a plethora of new jobs in coding, in data analytics, um, cybersecurity. And so, you know, they go, they, they register, they enroll in these boot camps, and, um, you know, they're finding jobs that they probably wouldn't have been able to find uh, with, you know, with just a bachelor's degree in a, in a liberal arts subject. Uh, or, or, or just by networking with you know alumni or friends. So I think you know schools are going to be investing in more professional educational opportunities, and somehow those professional opportunities, you know, professional educational opportunities will be connected to uh, to companies. Companies um, are going to be you know working with universities, I hope, and saying we need um, you know for instance we need uh, professionals with digital marketing backgrounds. Uh, that know how to run a digital marketing strategy, that know, um, you, you know, full stack web development and know how to develop, you know, really chic, attractive, marketable websites. Why don't, you know, they, they I think companies could help to curate and design new curriculum uh, in, in schools uh, and develop this town pipeline, but also, uh, you know, make it so that the courses that that students are are, are learning is not just theoretical, but it's it, they're obtaining skills that are applicable um, to the jobs that are that are ready for them once they graduate. Yeah, and that and that that's a really good point, selling in point you make because um, you know even before the pandemic, institutions have, of course been focused on work ready uh, programs for students graduating from higher education. But you're raising something new, which is not the design necessarily coming from within the institute, but rather from private marketplace or its sectors, through chambers, industry groups, perhaps playing a much more impactful role in that process. My question would be, not that that's probably not an accurate statement, I think it's coming, but the, doesn't that raise the um, eyebrows of the current structures that have been placed in higher education in terms of who's driving the bus, so to speak? I, I do. I, yeah, and I think you're probably referring to uh, core curriculum in, you know, across academic institutions. So, I, you know, with, you know, with where it fits in at Columbia, this is more kind of non-degree territory. I, th I think um, you know schools will need to invest more in online uh, learning platforms and the, uh, and and uh, enhancing the student experience as a way to uh, to amplify uh, course offerings uh, to get their attention. Uh, you know, uh, also as a way to grow enrollment. You know, if um, you know you know if if. If, uh, if there's a shift in demand in the Northeast and there are a lot of local, smaller um, liberal arts or small colleges that are really suffering uh, with enrollment, they may look to um, you know, online education 
um, and expanding the, you know, their uh, sort of their their ability to 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 serve the uh, the online student community and you know market their programs, you know, in in different areas and to different demographics around the country. But well, you, um, you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you raised something really interesting about that shift. And that, of course, raises the question of policy. So if we look at today, currently, there's going to be a movement, uh, how successful is to be determined down the road, of bringing at least some more increased level of manufacturing back to the United States. So in doing that, would you, in context to what you were describing, this shift, whether it's from the Northeast to the Southwest, would you see that playing a role in this new entrepreneurial uh, adaptability that institutions will have to play in partnership with both policy, it sounds like, as well as with business. Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know, going back to my point of the strategy of growing the non-degree um, space, you know, if, you know, if manufacturing is growing, uh, you know, I think these companies, not only could they partner with schools, um, and you know, provide them with the content, provide them with the curriculum. Uh, you know, could they use schools as as a as a location, as a place to train their own employees without those employees having to enroll in a, in a four year degree? Um, you know, I think it's a question about could could academic institutions expand their um, or branch out and and wear different hats, not just. Uh, you know, be a traditional four-year school or a graduate school. I think a lot of uh, a lot of schools could wear a number of different hats, and, and uh, you know, they could be uh, really strengthening their 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 core competencies on one hand, but also investing in online education technology. They could be hosting um, companies, employees for for training programs. Um, they, uh, you know, they they could be uh, you know working with companies that are unable to train. Um, on the spot or in person because they're worried about uh, the spread of COVID-19, and you know they they could um, you know host courses uh, online and use their own faculty to help train those employees. So I, I think it's it's I think it's really um, essential for schools to think outside the box a bit. I agree with you. I mean, one of the things that um, we do at Connecting Bridges and Borders uh, within the Institute for Dispute Resolution is we do a lot of thinking out of the box to connect our community and connect ourselves overseas back to our community. And these are some of the concepts that we've applied over the last several years in order to show how there's more value in the outreach than maybe the traditional way of outreach, which was only based on having a student come into the classic four-year education, but rather we are partnering, we're partnering with the cities, we're partnering with the policy, we're partnering with the chambers of commerce, and in doing so, it provides new intel and new understanding for that curriculum design, or for, as you point out, those partnerships. So it's a really fascinating, I think, time, and maybe it's a, it will be a time of creative destruction, where those that are able to adapt and think out of the box from the classic four-year education, um, perhaps will change itself. I want to ask you one more question, Timor, which I think is really important too in this new, new post-pandemic system design in terms of entrepreneurship uh, or thinking out of the box for, for institutions. So before the pandemic, many schools used the international um, business plan, if you will, to pull as many students as they could from places like China or India, uh, which were large, large concentrations where people could come to schools and fill that gap in the budget. Yeah? Given now the pandemic, we know that there's some challenges with that and schools are facing those challenges in their budgets. But Long-term sustainability of that model, do you see it coming back or do you see this as a past tense model that will be reviewed by scholars, but in terms of real practice, it will no longer be implemented? I think that, that's a great point. I think that's something else I wanted to add was, you know, schools 
thrive uh, on strong international recruitment and enrollment. So, uh, you, you know, with, with the rise of, of the pandemic, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a question of how do you attract those students, um, you know, during this crisis? And how do you make sure that, you know, matriculated students that are based internationally can continue their studies and, you know, finish their degrees on time? So that's, you know, that's part of my argument of, of you know, why you really have to um, approach online education um, and, and really make sure that, uh, you know, that it's, that it's well equipped to accommodate international students that may not be able to um, attend synchronous courses. Um, you know, and that's why, I, you know, there are a lot of schools out there that are developing asynchronous uh, content because there are students in, in, in a variety of time zones. Um, that, you know, they, they, they want to, you know, stay on top of their coursework. Um, but I think, you know, post-pandemic, uh, you know, I think, I think it's really going to be um, about, you know, how do we reopen? How does, how does, the, uh, how does the economy come back? Uh, what does that look like? What is it going to be like um, for students, international students, to obtain student visas? Is that going to change? Um, because you know, right now the borders are closed with Canada and, and Mexico. Um, I think right now it's very difficult for international students, or I mean, it's impossible for any sort of international student to, to physically travel to the United States. I, I assume once everything is hopefully back to normal, um, you know, we'll see international students come back, but uh, they're not gonna be coming back into the same higher educational climate, same economic climate. Uh, there aren't gonna be as many jobs or internships out there uh, for people graduating from, you know, undergrad or graduate schools. And not to say that the economy can't come back, it's going to take time. You know, you know, economists were early, uh, you know, early into this pandemic were, were predicting sort of this V-shaped recovery. But now that, you know, we've been, you know, two months into lockdown, we're seeing more of a, a steep cliff dive. Uh, and, you know, it's more, it's, it's more difficult to predict how the economy will come back. I think that is, um, uh, rel you know, related to, um, you know, the future of student enrollment. And, uh, you know, you have to look at the global economy. It, you know, it's since this pandemic is, is, is having an impact globally, will international students be able to afford full tuition? That, and that's, that's, you know, I, that's, um, that's something that I haven't, you know, I haven't heard sort of like firm response from universities on the hold. I'm not sure how they're going to encounter that, but I know that's something that they're probably thinking of. Well, this conversation has been really interesting, and I think for our listeners, it will leave a lot to digest because it's a, it's a, it's a something that I believe that is a process in formation with a lot of potential creativity beyond just the word adapt, adaptability. And It'll be interesting and exciting to see how the future holds for education and entrepreneurship within and outside its own borders. Um, and of course, we're using words that are very synonymous with what we do, which is connecting bridges and borders. So I wanna thank you, Timor, for taking your time today to provide some insight and your perspective on this important topic for, for many of us around the world. Uh, thank you, Professor Weiss. I really enjoyed uh, being on uh, the podcast today. Uh, you know, before you know, before closing, I did just want to mention. Uh, you know, we didn't really talk a lot about entrepreneurship, but you know, a another really important thing that I've learned, and you know, something that I'm really passionate about is is uh, is economic development and you know, equipping entrepreneurs, whether it be student entrepreneurs or um, you know, postgraduates. Uh, with, you know, with the tools to survive as entrepreneurs. And I think, uh, you know, I think it's important uh, that we, we look at entrepreneurship programs uh, across academic institutions, whether it be small, medium, or, or larger schools. Um, you're you're, you're going to see more entrepreneurship programs grow. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that, uh, like, in New York City, um, you know, there are a consortium of New York City schools that um, are... Uh, invested in, in something called the New York City Media Lab, uh, which is all about, um, you know, research and development 
uh, in the space of media technology. Uh, there's also something called the New York City R Lab, which, uh, which is really growing AR and VR technology. How can VR and AR technology be used uh, in everyday life? And sort of going back to kind of an earlier conversation, I think you know, VR, AR technology will be really, really important, uh, especially in the education space. Especially if uh, you know if we have uh, you know if we have learners that can't physically be present on campus, um, to using AR and VR technology um, to be able to to learn better, to or more efficiently. Um, you know, we can say that for for another discussion. But um, I think you know you're going to notice um, more entrepreneurship programs across schools, um, and I think it's important because they are a bridge. Uh, you know, there are a lot of these entrepreneurship programs that are all about tech transfer. So it's connecting scientists, engineers at large research institutions with, uh, with the business world and with investors. Um, so I, you know, I, I think um, it's really important to highlight, um, you know, that there's going to be um, a growth in entrepreneurship, especially during and after this crisis, because there are going to be a lot of um, students who are graduating from these programs without a job. Um, and there are also going to be a lot of people in the small business arena who are losing their jobs, like restaurateurs, those that own uh, bars, you know, who are in the food and beverage industry, that are going to have to learn, um, you know, how to develop a business plan, how to go out for funding, uh, how, to, um, how to approach banks for, for small business loans. So um, I think all of that is, is really important. Um, and, you know, just my kind of closing thoughts is, you know, education is indispensable. It's not going to go away. I just think it's going to look different in the next few years. I think schools are going to be uh, investing in online education technology. Um, the non-degree space is going to be growing. I think schools will host a lot of corporate programs um, and, you know, and tapping uh, their, you know, their ex experts and their researchers, you know, and faculty to help deliver this content. So, um, you know, it's, it's exciting. You know, I, I understand right now for smaller schools, it's, it's definitely you know a, a very nerve-wracking time, not knowing what's going to happen in the fall. But um, you know we have to we have to remain optimistic. Well, I want to thank you for that, and I want to also remind our listeners that under the Institute for Dispute Resolution and its Connecting Bridges and Borders program, we have the Innovation Entrepreneurship New Jersey City University Jersey City Connect project, which includes a number of the different things that uh, Timor has spoken about. Uh, so check us out. Uh, including uh, the coming coming soon idea creation lab. Once again, this is Professor Weiss from New Jersey City University's Institute for Dispute Resolution. I want to thank my special guest on education, entrepreneurship, innovation, business, international discussions, and even economic development as well for coming on today. And I want to thank my listeners once again. And until next time, be safe. Bid adieu.